Good evening. The Japanese government has strongly condemned Islamic State over a video supposedly showing the beheading of the hostage Kenji Goto. Mr. Goto, a journalist, went to Syria in October. Earlier today, Japanese officials said negotiations with Islamic State to free him had become deadlocked. Both Japan and Jordan had been trying to secure his release, along with that of a Jordanian pilot, in return for the freeing of an Al-Qaeda member held by Jordan. Caroline Hawley's report does not contain images from the video. Kenji Goto, married with two young children, apparently beheaded by the militant with the British accent, who's already murdered other hostages. The video, which we're not showing, says the journalist was killed because of Japan's support for the coalition fighting IS. The Japanese government expressed its disgust, saying it would work with the international community to bring those responsible to justice. A spokesman called it a deplorable terrorist act. Kenji Goto was last seen crossing into Syria in October. He's thought to have been trying to negotiate the release of his friend, a self-styled military contractor, Haruna Yakawa. The first demand came on the 20th of January. For the two men, IS wanted $200 million within 72 hours. A day after that deadline expired, it released a video which appeared to show that Haruna Yakawa had been beheaded and it issued a new demand, not money, but the release from a Jordanian jail of a female suicide bomber whose bomb had failed to go off. In 2005, Sajida al-Rashawi made a televised confession with the device that didn't detonate. She, together with her husband, had targeted a wedding party, a banqueting hall full of people who'd come to celebrate. For her part in the plot, she's been on death row for almost a decade. Jordan had agreed to free her in return for its captured pilot. Muad al Kasaspi had been on a bombing raid against IS but had to eject from his F-16 as it crashed. The Jordanians had insisted on proof of life before they released Shajida al-Rashawi. None came. In Japan, the public waited and hoped, rallied in support of Kenji Goto as the crisis unfolded halfway across the world. His mother had appealed for his release. Dear Prime Minister, please save my son's life. Kenji only has a little time left. Experts say the strategy of IS is to undermine the coalition, that it'll see the fact that it got Jordan to negotiate as a success. America has... As a success. America has stated repeatedly it would never negotiate with the Islamic State. It doesn't recognize the Islamic State as a state or as Islamic, and it would never sit down with the Islamic State. Jordan has already broken that principle, and I think that creates at least the perception of division within the coalition. The Japanese journalist and the Jordanian pilot, their fates linked in the most macabre of ways. His family still waits for news as Kenji Goto's begins to mourn. Caroline Hawley, BBC News. Well, in a moment, we'll be speaking to our Middle East correspondent, Yelan Nell, who's in Jordan. But first, let's go live to Rupert Wingfield Hayes, who's in Tokyo for us. And Rupert, strong words of condemnation for, from the Japanese government there over what's turned into a real tragedy for the country. It has, and uh, the government this morning, uh, as it has all along throughout, has been saying it's doing its best uh, and that it wants to get Mr. Goto out, wanted to get Mr. Goto out, and it was negotiating. But I think if you look at what Mr. Abe, the Prime Minister, has said this morning in response while condemning this killing, he's also said, we will never give in to terrorism and we will hunt these people down. Now, this, this is the language of the UK and the US in these sorts of situations, and he is very much putting himself in that group. He's basically saying Japan is going to remain tough, uh, and in these sorts of instances, it will not back down in the face of threats against his citizens. So while it's obviously very sad and terrible for the family, and there will be, there will be consternation here uh, at this conclusion to this drama, I think Mr. Abe and the Japanese government are basically saying we are with America and the UK and we will not, we will not give in to these sorts of demands. Given that, this is the logical conclusion of this crisis. And your land, there's no mention of the Jordanian pilot in that IS video. Concern about him must remain very high. 
That's right, and really it's surprising too because the fate of these two men has been tied together in the latest messages that we've heard from Islamic State. Now, I spent the last few hours with the family of Lieutenant Muath al Kasasba, and they told us they had no new information about him. But after this video came through, they did say that they hoped to God that he was still alive. The Jordanian government has, of course, offered to exchange this Iraqi woman prisoner, uh, Sajida Arashawi, for its pilot. But that was not the deal that Islamic State offered. They only offered to spare the life of the pilot and perhaps exchange this woman for Kenji Gutho. This could all be a sign that really um, he is a special bargaining chip for Islamic State, somebody they can use to put extra pressure on the international coalition that's fighting against them. OK. Yolande in Amman and also Rupert in Tokyo. Thank you very much. The German Chancellor Angela Merkel has said she won't support cancelling any of Greece's huge debt. Greece's newly elected government, led by the left-wing Syriza party, wants to halve the amount it owes and it's already started easing austerity measures. But Mrs Merkel said billions had already been written off by private creditors and the programme of cuts should continue. From Athens, here's our correspondent, Mark Lowen. Europe's newest leader has shaken the continent to its core. Alexis Tsipras is a fresh face with a fresh approach, reversing austerity and calling for a debt write-off. It's a huge challenge to Europe's economic policy, but today the EU's paymaster hit back. Germany's Chancellor Angela Merkel told a newspaper she did not envisage fresh debt cancellation. Europe will continue to show solidarity with Greece, she said, as with other countries hard hit by the crisis, if they carry out reforms and cost-saving measures. But it's those measures that have fanned the flames of protests, from Athens to the streets of Madrid to the furious scenes in Rome, a Europe that once spelt hope was overcome by fear of the future. And today, a stark warning from Brussels that without change, the European dream will collapse. If Europe doesn't deliver on growth and job, if Europe is seen as the place for austerity, if Europe is not seen as a hope, uh, as a progress, but as a constraint, as a punishment, as a pain, then the European project will be not only criticized, but rejected. It's a message that chimes with those like Theodora, Multilingual and highly educated, she's been unable to find work since the crisis hit, austerity hindering the green shoots of growth. I'm living on my savings and, uh, and, small, and odd jobs, which means that there are many things that I cannot do that I used to do before. I used to go to the cinema, I used to go to the theatre, I used to buy books. It's not that uh, I can't get that job, it's that the job doesn't even exist. Greece was the laboratory for Europe's austerity. It's being pushed back here. But tonight, Alexis Tsipras is sounding conciliatory too, talking of a mutually beneficial agreement without conflict, allowing Greece to breathe. He knows he faces powerful opponents, but he is radically shifting the debate. Mark Lowen, BBC News, Athens. Meanwhile, in Spain, tens of thousands of people have marched through Madrid in the biggest show of support yet for the country's own anti-austerity party, Podemos. The party, formed just a year ago, is hoping to emulate the success of Syriza. And Madrid correspondent Tom Burridge was at the rally. At times today, it felt like a rock concert. But this was a political rally of Spain's new far-left party. Look at the Greek flag. They feel inspired here. And some people crave change. I don't know what Angela Merkel can possibly think of all this. I think she's just scared of change. And I think change is constant and you can't, you know, you can't go against it. This bus left Valencia at five in the morning to join the march. Podemos is a grassroots movement born out of Spain's financial crisis. We are fed up with corruption, with inequality, with poverty, with misery and with the political uh, measures of austerity that is um, like killing our country. The party, Podemos, whose name means we can, said this was not a protest but a celebration. Like in Britain, this is an election year in Spain and this far-left party is now topping many of the opinion polls here. 
What this political party is successfully doing is tapping into a deep level of dissatisfaction with the traditional political class in Spain. Tens, if not hundreds of thousands, squeezed into this iconic square to listen to their leader. Eso es corrupción. Pablo Iglesias is a friend of Greece's new prime minister. Whether or not his party wins at the end of this year, Spanish politics have already changed. Tom Burridge, BBC News, in Madrid. A British military health care worker has been brought back to England to be monitored for signs of Ebola after being injured with a needle in Sierra Leone. The individual who had been treating someone at the time is being assessed at the Royal Free Hospital in London. The fundraising campaign for a disabled pensioner, Alan Barnes, injured after being mugged outside his home in Gateshead, has now raised nearly £190,000. Katie Cutler, who started the fund with an original target of £500, said she couldn't believe how much had been raised. Now with all the sport, here's Ollie Foster at the BBC Sports Centre. Ollie. Thank you, Rita. We'll start with today's football in, in England and Scotland. Depending on where you're watching, match of the day or sports scene follows the news. But if you can't wait that long, want the results now, here they come. There was just the one draw in the Premier League, and that came at Stamford Bridge, where Chelsea missed out on the chance to go eight points clear at the top of the table. Loic Remy gave them the lead before David Silva equalised. It finished one all, so City remain five points behind the leaders. Elsewhere, there were away wins for Everton and Newcastle. Daniel Sturridge scored on his return from injury for Liverpool. They beat West Ham 2-0. Manchester United beat Bodden Club Leicester 3-1 to go third. There were wins for Stoke and Sunderland. And Harry Kane scored twice for Spurs in a 3-0 win at West Brom. Dundee United are through to the Scottish League Cup final. Nadir Chifchi's late goal knocked out the holders Aberdeen. Celtic face Rangers in the other semi tomorrow. Meanwhile, all three games in the Scottish Premiership ended one all today. Serena Williams has won the Australian Open for a sixth time. It's her 19th Grand Slam singles title. She beat Maria Sharapova in straight sets. This time tomorrow, we'll know if Andy Murray is the men's champion, but he'll be the underdog against Novak Djokovic. Ben Smith reports. In the frame, centre stage. All eyes will be on Andy Murray tomorrow morning as he attempts to win a first Australian Open title. But the Scot is well aware that Novak Djokovic is a truly formidable opponent. I've never won here. I just won here four times. That he would go into the match, obviously being the being the the favourite. And if I was to win tomorrow, yeah, I would feel like it would be a, a big upset. Djokovic has won both finals the men have contested in Australia, and history would appear to suggest the Serb should prevail again. But if Murray and his camp can keep their cool in the Melbourne heat. It could yet be remembered as another landmark day in British sporting history. It was another of the sport's great rivalries that contested the women's final earlier in the day. Serena Williams against Maria Sharapova, world number one against world number two. The American dominated from the off, taking the first set 6-3, before serving her way to victory in a second set tiebreak. Her sixth Australian Open title took her beyond many of the great names of the past, this was Serena Williams as we've rarely seen her before, leaping ever closer to tennis history. Ben Smith, BBC News. And that's your sport tonight. Rita. Ollie, many thanks. The actress Geraldine McEwen, best known for playing Agatha Christie's Miss Marple, has died at the age of 82. During a long career in TV, theatre and film, she worked with Laurence Olivier and Kenneth Williams and won a BAFTA in 1991 for her role in Oranges Are Not the Only Fruit. Our arts correspondent Rebecca Jones reports. Marple, is that correct? Yes, Inspector. Quite correct. You Precise and petite. Geraldine McEwen first appeared as Miss Marple on television in 2004. It was a role that introduced her to a new audience, many of whom were too young to remember her early successes. Born in Windsor, she had no formal training, but was acting in the local theatre by the age of 14 and soon starring in the West End. She appeared on stage with actors including Leslie Phillips and Laurence Olivier. She played a variety of roles on television won a BAFTA for her part as the mother in Oranges Are Not the Only Fruit. Who was the oldest man in the Bible? Refusal. How old was he when he died? 969. What sort of tea is this? 
stand up and be counted. I mean, Empire Blend. Just in time for the missionary report. Soon? Make haste. She also appeared in several films. Among them, Kevin Costner's Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, alongside Alan Rickman. But Geraldine McEwen will be remembered best as Miss Marple, a performance which one critic described as being a mix of mischief, tenacity, and as curious as a mouse. Geraldine McEwen, who's died at the age of 82. Well, that's all from me now. Good night. Hello, it's turning into another icy night out there and the weekend still has some more snow in it. It's coming down hard over the mountains of northern Scotland. The wind's so strong, we have blizzards here, significant drifting snow. And then across other parts of eastern Scotland and running down through eastern England as the night goes on. Coastal rain, inland sleet and snow, maybe two to five centimetres, as much as ten on the hills here. And snow showers for Northern Ireland and still a few for Wales in the southwest. A bit more snow to come into the moors. And for other parts of southern and southeast England later in the night, some light snow around could give a centimetre or so in places. So don't be surprised if some of us here wake up to a light covering in the morning. So an icy and snowy start in the morning. This is the picture at nine o'clock. Still some of these snow showers in northern Scotland. The intensity though easing along with the wind gradually and a few wintry showers for Northern Ireland and coastal parts of the west during the day. But actually for the bulk of Scotland, Wales, Western England at this stage, there'll be plenty of sunshine to greet us, but plenty of cloud, central and eastern England and still some outbreaks of rain, sleet and snow with a keen wind, a raw day here, particularly as it doesn't clear until later in the afternoon from easternmost parts, so it stays rather grey. But for many of us, actually, tomorrow is a fine day. Some crisp winter sunshine doing absolutely nothing for the temperature. Mid to low single figures, still enough wind to make a difference as well, making it feel at or below freezing. But with lighter winds and clear skies, tomorrow night looks very cold indeed. That's it. Good night. <laughs> An exciting day for football and goals in every game. Match of the day, next. Both victims were policemen. It stops. Come on, you and me. It was always on. <laughs> Silent Witness, Monday at 9 on BBC One. Yes, cows! Oh, look Jeez. at that! We've been outwitted by cows. Brand new Top Gear continues tomorrow at 8, only on BBC Two. It is set to be a titanic, doesn't it? An air of anticipation. They will absolutely be loving this. The Six Nations, the friendliest of rivalries. Until Rugby's greatest championship, the Six Nations, kicks off on Friday with Wales v England at 7.30, live on BBC One. The Football League show on the way.